Good evening folks, this is Dr. Paul. Thank you very much for tuning to my channel today. Today I want to talk about this uh, Ebola virus and as you know, Ebola is uh, everywhere in the news and the television and uh, people are gripped by the fear. And I want to talk a few minutes about this and uh, the world has known so many epidemics. The plague wreaking havoc and smallpox wreaking havoc. And uh, you might have heard about uh, the plague, the Justinian plague that uh, wreaked havoc throughout the Byzantine Empire back in the uh, 6th century, the bubonic plague. Uh, in, um, in 14th century, the Black Death. And it destroyed so many people in Europe. So the Justinian plague in the 6th century and uh, in 13th century, the Black Plague. These are the natural disasters, and this is a natural disaster we are seeing right now. And uh, it brings, these natural disasters, they bring the worst and the best from us. And I was reading a book recently about Galen, and Galen, he, uh, he had a first-hand experience with, uh, uh, with, the, with the plague that wreaked havoc in 166 AD in Rome. And the Rome was evacuated. There were dead bodies all over the place. And you see the, the strongest, the mightiest empire of Rome was just shaking because of this plague. And the Galen, the most uh, brilliant uh, physician was, and he was from Pergamon living in Rome at the time. And uh, everybody was reading his books for the next 1000 years. His books would rule the medical science. And Galen said, I mean, let them die. I don't have to take care of these people. And he returns back to Pergamon. So these natural disasters are, they just strain the physicians. It's a question of their ethics. Are you going to stay and uh, see these people? Are you going back to home to save your own life? And we are seeing the same thing here. Many people are becoming heroes going to Liberia and Dallas and fighting this disease. On the other hand, many people are running away. Many doctors, nurses, and other staff are running away while other staff are standing there. So the natural disasters are a test of our nature, your human nature, it brings the worst or the best from us. And now let me tell say a few things about uh, uh, the Ebola. I'm, going, I'm not going to rush you because it's an important topic. I am going to slow. Back in 1976, there are many several hemorrhagic fever deaths in Zaire and Sudan. And people wondered where are these deaths coming from. And many people thought Marburg virus came back. But this, this virus is, uh, has antigens that is different from Marburg virus. And it called Ebola. So it was, the first attack was 1976, so 38 years ago. And Ebola has been coming up in different forms, even from monkeys from Philippines. When they were brought to the United States, there was a, a, an Ebola-like virus, and it's called Reston strain of Ebola virus. And the reservoirs could be monkeys. Now, the question is, why is Ebola so deadly? Why is it so deadly? The answer, folks, is like these viruses, they cause fulminant lethal hemorrhagic disease with a shock in humans. That is the reason. I mean, both Ebola and Marburg virus, they can, they can, uh, they can attack the endothelial cells and cause necrosis. So you're seeing a patient, literally his vascular endothelial cells undergoing necrosis. And no wonder these people sometimes carry like 100% mortality rates. What happens is like these viruses produces uh, glycoproteins, whether secretory or transmembrane, and these glycoproteins, they interact with neutrophils to inhibit early activation of inflammatory response in the patient's body. Like it's like a, a group of robbers going and destroying the police. They want to rob a village, but first they destroy the police. In the same way, these endothelial cells, they destroy the neutrophils, the policemen of our human body, and then they wreak havoc throughout the system. The incubation period is like four to six days. And uh, you see, that's, that's so deceptive. That's why 
like a patient can come, come uh, can t take a flight in Liberia and go to Dallas and the symptoms just uh, start as he just going out Dallas airport because the incubation period is like four to six days the patient can have a normal flight time and the interesting thing is uh, as much many as seven percent of people in West Africa carry antibodies to Ebola that means like many of them are undergoing subclinical infection with this virus so you see Ebola can cause mild infection but when it comes it carries extremely high mortality rates now where did we get this name Ebola Ebola virus is named for the river in Zaire that was the site of an outbreak of hemorrhagic fever in 1976. So uh, it's a river in Zaire. Now Zaire is adjacent to Uganda and you see in Uganda what do we have? We have uh, Lake Victoria right that's where the Nile River starts and flows through Sudan and uh, it goes all the way through Egypt. So the reservoirs in this lake probably explain why this disease is going up and see folks in the next few months it may be in Egypt going right away into the Mediterranean and the countries like Israel and Lebanon would also be affected by this problem. Now let me see a few symptoms and signs. Symptoms and signs I mean all viral infections as you know causes like vomiting, diarrhea, fever but the problem with Ebola is it causes hemorrhagia like hemorrhagic fever, thrombocytopenia many times it ends in disseminated intravascular coagulation that's where the scare comes from that is the challenge the biggest challenge no doctor would want to listen to that word disseminated intravascular coagulation because it is extremely hard to treat that problem that explains the high mortality rate of this problem so Ebola hemorrhagic fever is quite rare but uh, right now more than 3300 people died in Liberia and there are like six or seven cases found in the United States but as I speak there are no deaths so far hopefully it will stay like that but there is no guarantee now if you come to the morphology of this virus Ebola and Marburg they are negative sense single stranded RNA viruses arranged in helical nucleocapsid typical filovirus particle it is a single linear so it is a single stranded RNA virus that's why it's, it looks like a spaghetti or it's also called a shepherd's crook because it is so long in fact it is the longest virus we know they are the longest viruses and they are largely destroyed by heat like 60 degrees centigrade at 30 minutes or by acid but in human blood they can stay even at room temperature the viruses are largely destroyed by heat like 60 degrees Celsius at 30 minutes and I think that's an important point to remember why you see that, that that's a very problematic point especially in the countries like United States or Europe because as we are right now we are moving through winter so if this virus can only be destroyed at 60 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes imagine this virus is not going to be dead in winter in winter when the temperatures go down this virus is not going to die and that's a scary thing folks and hopefully and everybody should pray that God will protect humanity from this deadly virus and um, but as I said I, I just uh, covered the basic points the most the mortality is coming from hemorrhagia the thrombocytopenia the low platelets and uh, that's what you need to concentrate the disseminated intravascular coagulation that's what you want to prevent and uh, as I said, these are single-stranded 
linear viruses, the longest viruses, the phyloviridae family, and they die at 60 degrees Celsius. Uh, higher temperatures are good. The other thing is the transmission. And the people who are handling the blood and secretions from these patients should take care of them from, uh, from contaminating other people. And that's very common. Like that right now, what is happening in Liberia? Because in these developing nations, they don't have many resources. They have to use the same syringe and needle from patient to patient to patient. They are transmitting that virus from patient to patient because of reusing these uh, syringes and needles. And uh, I remember things like I, I did my medical school in India and uh, in our hospital, we, don't, we I mean, we, we have to use again and again because our resources are very limited. So as, as we use these needles and syringes again and again without decontaminating them, without sterilizing them, what happens is like we are transmitting the infection from person to person. And the same with the, the secretions, so the patient's vomits, so the patient's excreta, the patient's sweats. All these things will carry the virus from other people. So I carried uh, the, the basic points and uh, I'm going to talk like next five videos just on Ebola because Ebola is going to come and it's going to stay here for a while because it's a highly contagious disease and uh, the, the whole world became a small globe right now. So yes, we are happy that we can fly from United States to any other, other place in the world within a few days, within a few hours, but uh, it carries a price tag. When outbreaks like this happen, it's very easy to bring these infections back to United States and other parts. And uh, probably, I mean, God forbid, this may become a problem. And uh, I hope that everybody who listens to you uh, get these points, especially taking precautions to prevent the transmission of this deadly virus. And I will talk to you again next video. Thank you very much. Subscribe to my videos and uh, uh, also visit our website at uh, www.drpaul.org. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.